I invite you to take your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6. And for those of you who are visiting with us today, to let you know that we are in a short series on the full armor of God in this uh, remarkable passage that details for us how to live the Christian life in response to the advances and the attacks and the assaults of Satan who would come against us. And today we find ourselves in verse 17, which is the fifth out of six pieces of the armor. I would encourage you to listen to the other previous messages that will set the context for everything that we will look at today. The title of the message is very simply, The Helmet of Salvation, and that will be our study today, The Helmet of Salvation. And trust me, you need to have a helmet of salvation. Uh, you need to have it on today. Uh, you need to know that the helmet of salvation is securely upon your head as you are living your Christian life. I want to begin reading in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And beloved, this is what we are up against. Verse 13, Therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm, stand firm, therefore having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And now here is our focus today. And take the helmet of salvation. And I, I may need another microphone up here. Maybe, why don't we shift to the pulpit mic? There we go. All right. All right, the helmet of salvation. Uh, the helmet of an ancient Roman soldier was a vitally important part of his armor. Every soldier needed protection for his head. A blow to the skull by the broadsword of an advancing army was surely to be a fatal blow. Rarely did a soldier on the battlefield ever recover from such a head wound against his skull. It is one thing to suffer a, a flesh wound to the thigh or to the forearm. Uh, such a blow would harm, but usually not kill, but to the head. Being struck on the head with a battle axe meant a sure and immediate death. In fact, it would lead to the most gruesome of all deaths, decapitation, in which the head would be severed from the rest of the body. No foot soldier in ancient times would ever dream of going into battle without his helmet on. Uh, having no helmet on was insane. It was suicidal. Now, so important was the helmet that it, as well as each of the other pieces of the armor, literally meant the difference between life and death, between victory and defeat. So what we are looking at here today, what Paul will have to say to us, is no small matter of importance in our spiritual lives. So I want us to dig into this, and I want us to understand what is Paul saying when he says the helmet of salvation. Well, there are three main headings, again, that I want us to, to use as a template to lay over this text to, to help us organize our thoughts and, and be structured in our thinking as we probe into this. Uh, first, 
the historical background. Then second, the, the spiritual meaning. And then third, the personal application. I want us to begin with the historical background. Because before we can understand what the helmet of salvation means for our lives, we first must understand what a helmet was in the first century to a Roman soldier. So we need to go back 2,000 years and put ourselves virtually into the Roman army and to understand something of, of what this helmet was. In the first century, the helmet of a Roman soldier was obviously an important piece of the armor. Uh, it was made out of very tough metal, a metal like bronze or, or iron that was strong enough to resist a descending blow by a broadsword. Uh, a broadsword was a very long sword, three to four inches, uh, three to four feet long, that an opposing uh, soldier would hold with two hands and make uh, a very uh, aggressive uh, swing at his opponent, and he would be usually going for the head, to, to lop off the head. And so the helmet had to be made of resilient uh, bronze or or iron that could withstand uh, a devastating blow. On the inside of, of the metal helmet was a lining of either leather or felt that made the heavy weight of this helmet bearable. Uh, it covered the entire head. In fact, it was large enough to cover the back of the neck. It also extended out over the top part of the of the shoulder as well, and it had uh, uh, almost like a football helmet with a, with a mask. Uh, it had a, a brow ridge that fit over the face to protect the eyes and the, the nose, so it formed a protective uh, front, almost like a cage over the front, and there were hinged pieces on the side, cheek pieces that could be opened up or, or closed, and in going into battle, you would close the cheek pieces in order to protect the sides of your face, and it was kept in place with a chin band, much like a chin strap on a, on a football helmet or on a, uh, um, uh, someone who was in a marching band to keep that helmet in place. Th this helmet was a very formidable piece of the armor. And on top, there was a plume or a crest that identified the soldier as being in the Roman Empire, and it served really to inspire the soldier that he was a part of the empire and he is marching in the name of, of Caesar. And so this was something of the background of the helmet. And when the Roman soldier knew that the enemy was coming, he took up, took hold of his helmet and, and put it on. Uh, the helmet protected the head, uh, it, which was a major target in battle, and it protected the head specifically from this broadsword or sometimes even a battle axe, um, which was a, a, a devastating instrument that if you didn't have your helmet on, there is no way for you to survive such a blow. And so the helmet protected the head, it protected the neck, it protected the shoulders, it protected the cheeks, the nose, the eyes, and even a sense of the, of the chin from the devastating blow of the broad sword. I think we gain some understanding of what an important piece of the armor this helmet was. And as it is the fifth of six pieces, there's almost a, an ascending uh, order here of, of importance that the soldier must have his helmet on. So this is the historical background, and this is what was in the mind of Paul as he says, the helmet the helmet of salvation. And this is what flashed into the minds of the Ephesians 
when they received this letter and their pastor stood before them and read this to the congregation, and as this letter was then circulated to other New Testament churches, in their mind, immediately they saw this metal, resilient, tough helmet that provided enormous defense in the day of battle. Now, second, the spiritual meaning. Uh, it is critically important that we understand the, the imagery here that is intended by Paul regarding the spiritual life. When he says the helmet of salvation, uh, we have the picture of the helmet in ancient times, but to transfer this now to our Christian lives, what is Paul intending for the Ephesians to understand when he says, you must take the helmet of salvation. And as I give explanation to this, I want to remind all of us here that you too must take the helmet of salvation. It is being offered to you by our commander-in-chief, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Isaiah 59 and verse 17, Christ himself is pictured as the messianic warrior who is clad in this very same armor of God, winning the victory for us at the cross as he defeated the devil. And it is as though Christ now takes off the helmet that he wore and he is extending it to you and to me. And Paul now, by apostolic authority, says, take the helmet of salvation. It is the very helmet of salvation that the commander-in-chief, the Lord Jesus Christ, was wearing. That text also speaks of the breastplate of righteousness and other aspects of the armor. What we are putting on in reality is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So what is this helmet of salvation? Well, let's begin with the helmet. Uh, the helmet protected the brain. The helmet protected the mind. Uh, the helmet was a defense against the enemy's attack against the center of one's thinking. It was a protection of one's mindset, of what one thinks and how one thinks. If the breastplate covered the affections in the heart, the helmet covers our thinking and our thinking regarding salvation, the helmet of salvation. Now, when he says, take the helmet of salvation, he is not saying to the Ephesians that you need to be saved. Uh, they have already been converted to faith in Jesus Christ. We know that from earlier verses in this epistle. But when he says, take the helmet of salvation... He is saying some, some specific things to us regarding our salvation. Now, we need to think of salvation in the fullest biblical sense of past, present, and future. Uh, there is a very real sense in which the Bible says we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. Uh, we have been saved in justification. When we believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, his perfect righteousness was imputed to us and we were eternally forgiven and we received the righteousness of Christ. There is now therefore no condemnation who are in Christ Jesus. But that began the process of sanctification which is our growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are being saved from worldliness. We are being saved from ungodliness. We are being saved unto Christ-likeness and the image of Christ. And, and this goes on throughout the entirety of our Christian lives. And one day we will be saved in glorification saved from the very presence of sin as we will be in heaven. There will be no sin in us. Right now in sanctification, there remains 
sin in us, in heaven one day, in glorification, there will be the eradication of the sin nature, uh, there will be no longer any sin even within us, and we will be in a perfect land without any sin around us, and we will be fully, completely saved. So when he says put on the helmet of salvation, uh, he is thinking of the fullness of our salvation, and he is saying two things specifically. And, and here's where I want you now to, to lock in with me. He is saying regarding our salvation, number one, that you need to have the assurance of your salvation. You need to know that you know that you know that you are saved. You need to have a blessed assurance that you are in Christ and that when you die, you will immediately stand in the presence of God, faultless with full exception. And no one can fight in spiritual warfare unless they know which side they are on. There has to be full, complete assurance of one's salvation. And we will never be effective in resisting the devil unless we know for certain I am on the Lord's side. And the devil is my enemy. And if there is some doubt, if there is a sliver of doubt, if there is a, a small percentage of doubt, I, I will be hesitant in warfare. There will be a paralysis of analysis as I'm in the battle. And I will not be wholehearted in resisting the devil until I know I am on the Lord's side and I am in his army. And so I want to ask you this morning, do you have the assurance of your salvation? Do you know that you know that you know that you know that you're saved? Uh, you can know. And it is ultimately granted by the Holy Spirit of God in the hearts of all those whom he has called and whom he has converted and brought into a saving relationship with Christ. That is the first idea that is, that is foremost on the mind of Paul when he says, take the helmet of salvation. You need to know that you are saved in the depth of your soul. And you cannot have one foot in Christ and one foot in the world and go, you know, I just hope at the end of my life when I die, somehow, some way, I'm in. Your life will be a casualty of war until you know that you are saved. You will be of little use to the kingdom of God and the advancement of his truth until you are absolutely certain that you have been enlisted personally by the commander-in-chief and that you have been equipped by him and put into the battle. Second, what is intended and meant here is once we know that we're on the Lord's side, that in the midst of the battle and in the midst of the skirmish, we must know and be persuaded and be convinced that the victory belongs to our Lord and that in the last day he will triumph over all and that even in this day in which I live, he is carrying out his sovereign purposes in my life that as I find myself resisting the devil, resisting his temptations, fighting against his seductions, that I, am, that I am on the winning side and that the Lord Jesus Christ is Lord over all and that he is Lord over even the devil. And as I have quoted you so many times, as Martin Luther once said, the devil is God's devil. It is not a struggle war, a, a tug of war between two equal forces. There is only one blessed sovereign, and that is God. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, and we must have an overriding confidence in the sovereignty and in the victory and in the triumph of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, 
and that as we fight here in this world against the devil, there can be no room in our hearts for panic or for fear, no matter how fierce the battle may be, no matter where we may find ourselves in this world, no matter how great the pressure may be around us, no matter how it may seem that the forces of darkness are compressing around us, we must be reminded that God is upon his throne and that God is absolutely sovereign and that God is causing all things to work together for our good. Take the helmet of salvation and put it on your head and do not let any doubts whatsoever attack you and assail you and put you in a, a retreat mode in your Christian life. It is forward by faith. We will advance under the banner of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we will never be effective in the Christian life if we are going around as though Satan somehow is all-powerful. He is powerful, but he is not all-powerful. There is only one who is all-powerful, and that is God Almighty. A couple of years ago, I remember when John MacArthur shared with me how, how one church there in Los Angeles that was a very charismatic church, a very Pentecostal church, had an enormously man-centered theology, had a very low view of God, had a very high view of Satan, until their pastor was struck dead in the middle of a worship service and just died. And the other pastor got up and said, well, he was such a force for God, the devil killed him. Well, with that, and rightly so, half the church emptied, and many of them then came to Grace Community Church. And they were like trembling squirrels in a thunderstorm. And MacArthur told me, he said, I came to realize that these people had lived, these precious people, had lived their entire Christian life under the tyranny of believing in the sovereignty of Satan. They saw a demon behind every bush. They attributed anything and everything that ever went wrong to the devil. They had no concept whatsoever of the supreme authority of God in the heavens. And they lived their entire Christian lives just trembling, as it were, but from the shadow of the devil that might be cast across their path. And then in their coming to Grace Community Church and hearing again and again and again the sovereignty of God, the, the supreme authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, the present intercession of Christ at the right hand of God the Father, causing all things to work together for our good. It was as though, he said, they were let out of prison cells to finally live their Christian lives in a manner worthy of their calling. To put on the helmet of salvation is to realize who God is in this battle, who Jesus Christ is in this battle. All Jesus has to do is but blink his eyes and the victory is his. And Satan, he sails a, a sinking ship. He rules over a doomed domain. He has been crushed at the cross. He has been devastated at the empty tomb. And our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is already the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Satan is but a serpent. He has been cast down. To put on the helmet of salvation is to come to the realization of the sovereignty of God in salvation the sovereignty of God in providence and the sovereignty of God over the kingdom of darkness and the kingdoms of this world. Now, turn back, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 1. And 
Paul has really laid the groundwork for this, this already. And I want us to think about this in these, under these two headings as we look at some verses together. I want you to think with me about assurance of salvation, and I want you to think with me about the, about the irresistible, irrevocable, immutable triumph of the purposes of God in salvation. They cannot be thwarted. They cannot be defeated. That our God rules and reigns in the heavens. His sovereignty is over all, and He does whatever He pleases. So I want you to note, now let's, the helmet of salvation, let's, let's see this salvation. We've looked at this before, but let me remind us of what we already know in somewhat of a summary fashion. I want you to see first the sovereign election of the Father in Ephesians 1 in verse 4. This is where salvation begins. This is where salvation is birthed. This is where salvation is first conceived. Verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Just stop right there. Who chose whom? He chose us. We did not choose him. He chose us. This verb chose, eklegomai, means he chose out from many possibilities. Those whom he would have to be his people. He chose us. The verb tense and mood here would in indicate he chose us by himself and for himself. As there was no one to counsel him. There was nothing for him to foresee. He simply chose whom he would choose because he is God and for reasons known only to him. And so certain and sure is this salvation that verse 5 says he predestined us to adoption as sons. Now, this word predestination means that God made salvation to be irrevocable. He made his will and salvation to be immutable. There is no plan B, there is no plan C, that what God has purposed and chosen in all eternity past, not only the plan of salvation, but the people of salvation who would be the recipients of his sovereign grace. There are not enough demons in hell or out of hell to ever resist the predestinating purposes of eternal God in the heavens. All that God has planned and all that God has purposed in salvation cannot be thwarted one iota. What he has chosen, he has predestined, and he has guaranteed from before time began that it will be brought to fruition on into eternity future. To take the helmet of salvation is to recognize the eternal purposes of this salvation and how, how impossible it is for the saving purposes of God to be thwarted. And unless one has this, this understanding of, of God's eternal purposes, one will be living in one degree or another a weak Christian life and trembling at the circumstances in life and will be trembling at the very thought of Satan. So much so in verse 11. Please note, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will. Please note the devil is not working all things after the counsel of his will. It is God the Father who has an eternal decree, who has, who has drafted his plan. He has set it in stone. He will not alter it. 
and every moment of every day, every detail is a going according to his sovereign predestinating purposes. Not only has God sovereignly appointed the end, but he has appointed the means to those ends. And not only has he appointed the salvation of his elect, but he has appointed the preaching of the gospel, the prayers of his people, the holy living of the saints, uh, their witness and their testimony, the love that they would show to the unbelievers. All of that is, is planned and prepared by God according to verse 11. There's nothing up for grabs. Uh, there, there is nothing in limbo. Uh, there, there is nothing teetering on the fence, and we're waiting. God is waiting to see which way will it fall. God is the author and the architect of his eternal plan and his eternal purpose. We need to understand this in spiritual warfare. And we do not need to pick up some other helmet. We need the helmet of salvation and to understand the purposes of God the Father. Then second the sovereign redemption of Christ. Uh, we see in chapter 1 and verse 7, in him, referring to Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Now what makes this verse so strong is in chapter 2, verse 2. And go ahead and turn to chapter 2, verse 2. Because this is the black velvet backdrop that's going to make the diamond of 1 7, chapter 1, verse 7, shine all the brighter. Paul says in chapter 2, verse 2, in which you, referring to all of the, the believers in Ephesus, in which you formally walked, walked here refers, this is how you live. According to the course of this world, this world is satanically organized. It is sat a satanic system that hates God and opposes all that is godly. This evil world system. And Paul says, you formerly walked according to the course of this world. And now he adds this parallel phrase, according to the prince of the power of the air. That is Satan himself, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. What he is saying is, is Satan oversees this entire world system, the world of religion, the world of education, the world of government, the world of music, the world of entertainment, all of these worlds that are in opposition to God. They are anti-Christ. They are opposed to Christ and to God. And we all once were a part of this evil world system. And there is only one way to be released from this evil world system, and it is by what we read in Ephesians 1, verse 7, the redemption that is in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this word redemption means that Jesus entered this evil world system and bought all of the elect of God out of the domain of Satan. Now, the, world re the word redemption means the payment of a ransom price in order to secure the desired release of one held captive. And when Jesus went to the cross, he redeemed everyone whom the Father chose before the foundation of the world, and he bought us and if the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. And it was by the shedding of his blood that he secured the release out of Satan's kingdom and out of Satan's tyranny, everyone whom the Father chose and gave to him to be his own bride from before the foundation of the world. And the price, in verse 7, through his blood, through his sacrificial death upon the cross. He did not merely make us redeemable, he actually redeemed us upon the cross. He did not make us hypothetically redeemable if we would just add to it. No, upon the cross, he actually bought us. There was a transaction between God the Father and God the Son. Jesus shed his blood for his church 
and he received from the Father exactly what he purchased through his death upon the cross. And then it says, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. No matter what sin any of the elect would ever commit for the rest of their lives, it is under the blood, it has been washed, it has been imputed to Christ at the cross, and now his righteousness imputed to us, we have a faultless standing before God. And then third, the sovereign regeneration of the Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, working sovereignly in perfect unity. Look at Ephesians 2 and verse 1. I want you to see how glorious this sovereign regeneration of the Spirit is. In Ephesians 2 verse 1 we read, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. The you refers to all the believers in Ephesus. It refers to all the believers who have ever lived. This was our past. It is the present of every unbeliever. It was the past even of the elect before they were brought to faith in Christ. Even the elect who have been redeemed by Christ were dead in your trespasses and sins. The word dead signifies there is no moral ability whatsoever to save yourself. Neither is there any desire to seek salvation. The deadness extends to the mind, to the emotions, and to the will. Every part of our humanity was once dead in sin. But in verse 4 we read, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive. That's the new birth. That's regeneration. He has made us alive. It is a spiritual resurrection. Just as Jesus stood before the tomb of Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. So he stood before your dead heart. And at that appointed moment, he said, let there be life, and he made you alive in Christ. Dead men can't make themselves alive. Dead men can't do anything to facilitate their own resurrection. Dead men only stink and lay in a grave. It was all of God, and he made us alive. Verse 5, the devil could not hold us back, for the resurrection power of Christ is greater. And in verse 6, and raised us up. That's what God did in our lives. The Spirit raised us out of the grave of sin. You say, well, then where did the faith come from that I believed upon the Lord? Look at verse 8. You'll see where your faith came from. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, meaning your faith did not originate within you. Your faith was not your contribution to your salvation. Even your faith was not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It was God who granted saving faith to you as he raised you from the dead and enabled you to call upon the name of the Lord. It is all of grace, it is all of God, so that at the end of verse 9, no one may boast. And no one may say, well, you know, I was a little bit better person than my next-door neighbor, that's why I'm a Christian. That's why I had the good sense to believe. No, we were all dead in sin and in trespasses, but it was the sovereign regeneration of the Holy Spirit of God that quickened every one of the Father's elect and those for whom the spirit uh, for, that the Son has died for. And not only has he brought about this salvation, nothing can ever undo this salvation. Look in chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. This is a sealed work by the Holy Spirit, and when salvation comes to someone's life, 
they can never go back to being unconverted. In Ephesians 1, verse 13, in him, referring to in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, and we know how they believed, from Ephesians 2, verse 8, God gave them faith and God raised them to believe, you were, now here it is, you were sealed. Sealed here is like the, the seal of a king, as wax would be put on a document, and with his signet ring, he would seal shut the document, signifying that this document now bears his seal. No one may break this seal. It is the official decree of the king. We were sealed, note this, in him, in Christ, with the Holy Spirit of promise. This is saying that when we believe, we experientially were placed into Christ and the Holy Spirit at that moment sealed us shut in Christ. That no one could ever come and pry us out of Christ. That we ourselves could never fall out of Christ that we are self-contained, Christ-contained, spirit-contained within Christ. And then he adds, verse 14, further demonstration of our security, who, referring to the Holy Spirit, is given as a pledge. This word pledge means a down payment to secure a piece of property. It means a deposit in a bank account. It was also used of the equivalent of an engagement ring to uh, indicate full intention and that one day the full reality will come who is given, the Holy Spirit is given as a pledge of our inheritance. That is to say, God has an inheritance for us that is reserved in heaven, undefiled, fades not away, and that future inheritance in heaven is so secure and we are so secure that God has put the Holy Spirit within us like a down payment. He's put the Holy Spirit within us like a deposit to guarantee that there will be the full realization one day in heaven of our full inheritance. And then he adds, with a, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of the glory of his grace. In other words, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives guarantees our future glory and it guarantees that we will be God's full possession one day before the throne of God. Now, we, we just took a vast sweep that began in eternity past and concludes in eternity future before the throne of God. And it shows the sovereignty of God over every aspect, over every dimension of our salvation. That is why Psalm 3 verse 8 says, salvation is of the Lord. It is entirely His work. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, to understand what I just laid out, which I know most of us here today have been so well taught in and have already come to embrace. For others of you here today, you may have never even heard the word predestined used in public conversation. But it is a God word. It is a Bible word. And for us to have the helmet of salvation, we must understand the magnitude and the enormity of our salvation that it is all of God beginning in eternity past and it is all of God within time and it is all of God extending into eternity future. It is a work of sovereign grace. And therefore, we understand that the end of our salvation is secure. The end of our salvation is predestined. 
Therefore, we may enter into the conflict of spiritual warfare, knowing that the eternal purposes of God cannot be thwarted. And I may be hit, and I may be opposed, and I will be resisted, but it will never alter the eternal purpose of God to save my soul and to usher me one day into his presence forever and ever. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't come out of my bedroom. If I didn't believe that, I'd be scared to leave the house. If I didn't believe that, I would tremble at the thought that there is a that the devil is roaring, roaming about as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. If I didn't believe that, I would believe in the sovereignty of Satan. If I didn't believe that, I would be trembling at the thought of a demon behind every bush. But because of the sovereignty of God in this salvation, I take this helmet on, and there is a sense in which I feel invincible and bulletproof as I put on the full armor of God. Now this leads finally to the personal application. And I have two things to say under the personal application. Number one, have the assurance of your salvation. Assurance of salvation is based ultimately, and I want you to hear this, it is based ultimately not in what I have done toward God, but what God has done toward me. Assurance comes not from looking back to my past and walking an aisle or praying a prayer or being baptized or joining a church or, or anything that I have done. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. People go through the motions all the time. The issue is, what has God done toward my soul? Assurance comes from realizing what God has done towards me. God brought the word of God to me. God opened my eyes that I would understand its truths. God convicted me of my sin. God drew me to himself. God gave me the desire to be saved. God changed my heart. God gave me repentance and faith. God gave me an inner certainty that I belong to him. God has given me confidence in the perfect atonement of Christ. God has changed my life from the inside out. God is bearing fruit in my life. God is transforming me more and more from a pattern of sin to a pattern of righteousness. God is producing fruit of a changed life in me. That's where assurance of salvation comes from. It's not what I have done towards God. It is what God has done towards me. Do you have this assurance of your salvation? Are you certain that if you died today that you would be taken to heaven to be with God forever? This assurance comes from God. The God who chose you, the God who called you, the God who converted you is the God who convinces you that you are in Christ. 1 John 5 verse 13, These things I have written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. Everyone in this building ought to have a no-so salvation. You ought to know that you have eternal life. And then second, not only, not only must you uh, have the assurance of your salvation, but second, you must be persuaded of the eternal security of your salvation. All true believers have a salvation that is rooted and grounded in the sovereign will of God in eternity past and is anchored in eternity future. If you're a believer in Christ, you are as certain for heaven now today as if you have already been there 10,000 years. You are already seated with Christ in heavenly places. The eternal plan and sovereign purposes of God have, have already brought salvation to your life and it will never be turned away 
it will carry you all the way home. It is the sovereign hand of God that has brought you to be in Christ. It is the sovereign hand of God that will keep you in Christ. And it is the sovereign hand of God that will present you faultless before Christ in heaven. You are already presented faultless before his throne of grace. You are already an overcomer. You are already triumphant in the end. So fight on. You're on the winning side. Fight on. You are in the victorious army. Take courage. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. I conclude with this. Oliver Cromwell was the Lord Protector of England in the 17th century. He occupied a place of Puritan uh, glory in England's history as he stood between the monarchy reigns of Charles I and Charles II, who were both godless men. And right in the middle in England's history stands this towering figure, Oliver Cromwell. He was offered the kingship of England, and he refused it. I will be your Lord Protectress. It was said that the soldiers of Cromwell never lost a war and never lost a battle. And at the heart of it was they were so persuaded of the sovereign purposes of God. The chaplain of Oliver Cromwell was none other than England's Calvin, John Owen, the greatest theologian England has ever produced. That's who accompanied Cromwell into battle, giving him counsel from the sovereignty of God, and it bled over to the soldiers. And his troops believed that their destiny was secure. They believed that whatever battlefield they showed up on there, that showed up upon, they were there by divine appointment, by the eternal decree of God. And they would trust not in chariots, and they would trust not in horses, but they would trust in the name of the Lord their God. And as a result, they did prove to be courageous, they proved to be confident, and history records how invincible and victorious they were. There is a sense in which this should be true of each and every soldier of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Granted, we suffer setbacks in our attempts to live the Christian life, but these temporary setbacks are not the end, nor are they ultimate defeat for us. Our commander-in-chief, the Lord Jesus Christ, has already won the victory. He has already defeated our enemy. And he has already guaranteed his final victory at the end of this age. And as we go forth in the full armor of God, how confident and how courageous we should be. We should be bold enough to storm the gates of hell with a water pistol, if that is what would be required of us. Because Jesus is undefeated, and he has never lost a skirmish in which his soldiers have followed him into battle and put on the full armor of God. Let us, therefore, stand strong in the Lord's might.